You're welcome. So, Quest Love, you wrote an original song for Catherine Bigelow's film Detroit. The name of that song is It Ain't Fair. Uh, tell us a little bit about the origins of the song. Okay, so um, I was finishing uh, an episode of The Tonight Show, and my assistant just casually gave a message and said, here, call Catherine Bigelow. And my first response was, wait, she knows I'm alive? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I called her, um, trying to figure out what what's this about? And uh, she says, hey, uh, we're just finishing up the, the follow-up film. And um, I'd like you to watch it, screen it. And if you feel inspired, write a song to it. I said, okay. I said, so tell me about it. And she said, well, I would sort of like to uh, be purposely uh, vague about it. And I would like you to just watch it with this about as least amount of uh, information as possible. And so I thought, okay. And then she said, and then I'm gonna let you process it for 48 hours. And then you tell me uh, if you'd like to do it. And I was like, process it for 48 hours. He's like, yeah, I wanna, I wanna make sure that you, that it sinks in. So immediately I was like, well, hmm, what kind of film is it? Like how intense is this film? She was like, and I'm very familiar with all of her. And I mean like Point Break and, you know, Blue Steel all the way up to Hurt Locker and Zero Dark. Like I, I know her whole filmography, her whole canon. And I was like, how intense? And she's like, intense. So I was really curious. So I'm mean, so mysterious. It didn't even have a, have a title yet. It was called Untitled Follow Up Catherine Bigelow Film, <laughs> which is weird because even the title card looked real epic. But <laughs> <laughs> like they put they 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 put effort and work into the, the fonts and everything. Untitled Catherine Bigelow Follow Up Film. <coughs> which was hilarious to me. Um, so I watched it and I'll say 20, 25 minutes into it. I made the, uh, I made the projectionist stop the film. And I was like, okay, I gotta do some research search real quick because you gotta understand, I, I didn't know what I was, and I, I had a feeling what I was what I was watching. I knew it had to do with the Detroit riots, but I just wanted clarity on what I was watching, so that way I could stop overthinking as I was watching, because I didn't know if this was going to be about the black cop that worked at the uh, the restaurant, or if this was about the police department, or if this was about Motown Records. Or this was about the dramatics. I didn't. I wanted to know who, like, the main protagonist was going to be in the film. So I made him stop, ran out in the hallway, and started googling, and then fell down a Algiers motel rabbit hole um, concerning the dramatics. And what's weird is that I've known those guys forever, and not once. I mean, we talked about some of the most insane stories that have ever happened to those guys in their history. And it was to the point that even before I saw this movie, I kind of joked that, you know, the dramatics were one of the most unluckiest groups ever. I mean, not to a spinal tap place, but, you know, I often joke like, man, you guys are always getting into weird altercations and, and bad luck uh, places, but they never once mentioned Detroit in 1967. 
And so in my head, I was like, Psh, dramatics. I knew it. Yeah, they're unlucky, you know. So we started watching again. And this is right before the torture scene starts. And man, um, you know, just for me personally, like you couldn't help but internalize the fear and the pain of watching that 45 minute torture scene because I, I love these guys and they're musicians, you know? And unlike me, who has the luxury and the luck of what, my quest loveness, this and this, and you know, I, I get, you know, that's, that's the one area of my life that I rarely share on social media, which is the number of times I get pulled over in my vehicle, which, you know, I'll say has been a steady maybe six times a year, but always with the same results. Uh, window rolls down, they look, oh, it's you, man. Love your work, man. Sorry, good. You know, sorry about that. You know, like the dramatics didn't have that benefit of the doubt. And so, um, that scenario is literally that's my worst nightmare because, um, after Fallon, I'm always, uh, you know, I'll do DJ gigs in Dumbo, in Williamsburg. New York life, nightlife ends at three, four in the morning. You know, I'm, I did Heidi Klum's Halloween party and it ended at 4.30 in the morning. You know, thank God it was in Manhattan. Had it been in Williamsburg and driving home, I could have got pulled over. You know what I mean? And... That's just the kind of Russian roulette risk you take uh, in that particular position. And it's, it's like that, that's my worst nightmare, getting pulled over and praying to God something about me rings familiar, you know? And one guy was even like, Jimmy Kimmel. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, so she contacted me. Um, well, I, I couldn't take it because it was killing me inside. It was really killing me inside. Uh, I texted her late, 24 hours later, late, like midnight. I said, I, I got to talk about this with you. So she called and um, the first thing I tried to do was was talk myself out of it, you know, because I was just like, look, man, you know, if you have us in it, we might ruin it. But like, because there's, I don't think there's anything inspirational or, or um, you know, I knew like for movies like these, you might want to have something that gives people a feeling of relief or or hope you know, like the kind of thing that could also be played at uh, at the Olympics or something. And I didn't feel that, man. I just, so much, so much has happened during that time period in which I was creating that song. Most importantly, Philando Castile, his death in Minnesota had just went down. And I was just like, man, I said, for me to really humanize genuine pain in a way that makes a person empathize, I said, it's going to take eight minutes for me to, I don't know how to, in a, in a succinct way, I don't know how to, in three minutes and 30 seconds, really make someone feel that pain, which is weird because at the time, Sean Lennon had... Uh, enlisted me to work on, uh, to play on his mom's 
uh, record, which they taught me. You know, a lot of people kind of misconstrue Yoko Ono's uh, kind of free jazz, mm -hmm. primal screaming thing as just like, ah, whatever. But that stuff is therapeutic. Like playing it for us is therapeutic. And they were explaining to me how they were introducing the idea of scream therapy to John Lennon when he made the the, the Plastic Ono Band. And I think that album came out, what, 1970? 70, 70. So, yeah. And, oh man, so envious, like Mother. Mother's three minutes, but it just, it instantly grabs you. So by the time that he's screaming at the end, it just, it's it's to me it's 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 a genius thing to be able to quickly grab someone's attention like that and you know i told her i said i don't know if i'm at the place where i know how to solve that rubik's cube in such a record time that it could fit within the the pocket of the voting academy i said i need eight minutes i need eight minutes for quiet I need at least 45 seconds for it to be quiet so that when this plays in the movie theater, you know, I'm considerate enough to not rail my agenda down their throat, <laughs> you know, because anybody else would have just like, as soon as that movie hit, man, fuck this, you know, like just right. like <laughs> apes it. Um, but I, I, I didn't want to do that. I, I don't want to be over dramatic with it. I wanted to really reel people in and I knew that it was going to take, it's going to take a, a very precise, patient, slow process for you to feel that anger we had without overdoing it. So creating the song was the hard part because then it was like, who am I going to find to write the lyrics? Who am I going to find to help create it? So I automatically started, you know, com comprising a list of like people to help us. And um, Tariq was like, wait, what are you doing? I, I want to write this. And I was like, we've been together for 30 years, man. Like, since when do you start writing songs? Like, you write your verse for your rap, but what, you want to write the song? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, oh man, like, I don't want to drop the ball in this song, man. Like, I don't want to risk. I mean, I hate to say it. I underestimated. I didn't think, like, he had it in him. And when he submitted the song, my first thought was, like, yo, man, we've been together since the 10th grade, man. Like, how come I didn't know that you knew how to write songs? Like, I don't know. You never asked. <laughs> so. I'm like, we got 17 records. <laughs> At no point were you thinking like, okay, one of these songs should just be like a singing song. Like, what the hell have we been doing? Because um, it just knocked me out. Like, the lyric, it was spot on. And and I was, so instantly I got goosebumps just looking at it. And so I'll say the hardest thing to do was to, the hardest thing to do was to record, to physically record the song. Because it was 1967 and I am a cinephile and a purist to the bone, um, I'm cool with some movies taking artistic license to sort of go outside of, you know, like when they did Marie Antoinette or whatever. I mean, or Quentin Tarantino used like James Brown and Tupac and Django, that sort of thing. I mean, I'll accept some license but most of the times like i'm that guy that's like a music supervisor's nightmare because i will be on twitter and be like come on dude you know going well time is dolby c blind with you sides came out in 1983. <laughs> this film's 1974 that song was invented yet the technology wasn't invented yet that prevent that makes that song possible so i didn't want to violate the timeline i wanted the song to feel like it came straight from motown so, which is another weird two-week situation, uh, Sharon Jones had just passed away. 
Now, some of the Dat King guys are in our band now because of the Tonight Show. And I asked them, I said, well, now that Sharon's not here, like, what becomes of Daptone Studios? Like, do you guys just run out to the public now? Or, like, what happens? Um, just like, wow, what's up? If you want to record there, let us know, and we'll, we'll call the guys and hook it up. And that's what we did. We did Daptone, and we did um, Diamond Mine Studios. Like, those guys have, like, subgroups and sub-studios, like, all over Brooklyn. Um, but they're all straight Motown. They're, you know, all the equipment there is like straight. It's, it's like we had a DeLorean that went back in time, 88 miles per hour. So the the hardest thing was t- to figure out the math formula that would allow 19 musicians to record on eight tracks, um, which was lucky. I mean, we there was an eight track at Diamond Mine. There was a four track at Daptone. So you're dealing with 19 musicians, which when really further broken down, you're kind of dealing with maybe 28 mic outputs. So it's like, what do you record first? What do you bounce? What do you record? What do you bounce? And and we're all recording at the same time. We're not using any modern technology. We're not overdubbing. We're not doing any of that stuff. Like we're just recording for the first time in our 30 year history in front of each other in one take. Um, so it was hard, you know, you do a take and then the engineer comes in and readjusts the microphone and I was like, man, this 1967 process is killing me. Like it took us 18 takes to nail, nail it perfect. I mean, creatively and song wise, we had it, but then it was like sonically, you know, how far do the guitar and the bass have to be away from the drums for it to not bleed? And, you know, where do the strings fit in so that this person's not on top of them and, we all got to play quiet so the vocals can be heard. And so it was it was a hard, tedious process, but we did an, an amazing 18 takes. Well, it's a very powerful song. Uh, before we go, I, I wanted to ask you something. Uh, are you still on the selection committee for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Yes, I am. <laughs> um, You've uh, been instrumental in bringing in a lot of great uh, artists, uh, like Hall and Oates, for instance. I mean, are there people yeah. who? I'm shocked. I'm shocked. <laughs> I'm shocked I have influence. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, who are some people that uh, you know really influenced you that you're happy to see have been inducted, and uh, people who you would like to see inducted? Um. Okay, so I'm shocked. I got Bill Withers in. And I think it was an oversight, maybe because he's the letter W. This is what I learned about award seasons. If the word A is in your title, you're always on page one in the first, like, five things read. But, you know, heaven help your soul if you're anything past the letter P because the likelihood of someone just having the patience of not just, you know. No, it's, it's real, man. It's real. I know. Because a lot of because a lot of times I'll sit on the board, and I'll say a name, and they'll be like, "Yo, Todd Rundgren's not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame." I'm like, "Yeah, y'all. Like, we gotta go to the you know to page twelve and thoroughly <laughs> look. Like, there's names that we missed." Um, so it's 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 an interesting, amazing process because it's like. It's like the musical recreation of 12 Angry Men. Mm-hmm. And you're sitting there, and I feel like the, the, star, the, star, the star of that boardroom, man, is, is Tom Morello. I mean, I'm grateful and so fortunate to have been within two feet of him when he gave that kiss speech. Because like, like it was so damn inspirational. Even Jan Warner was about to just 
bust out and start playing like pomp and circumstance as you know like it was like one of those moments like in a rodney dangerfield like high school <laughs> comedy where it's like gosh darn it we oh kiss and you're like you know all of a sudden we're all standing like beautiful speech. like his speech was so inspirational i took one of my nominees that i was passionate about away so that i could double down for kiss so it's it's just weird how it, it it's 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 really like political washington lobbying you know you go in i go to lil steven and i'll say look man i'm gonna give you jay giles band but steven you gotta meet us halfway man you gotta give me janet if not janet at least shaka khan like we need more women in the rock and roll hall of fame so look i'll go zombies like, I know you want me to go with Proco Harum, but I'll go Zombies and I'll go Jay Giles Band, but you got to give me one. But like, you're, you're there early. Mm -hmm. so you can sort of have influence. And it depends on what your approach is. Because even, um, I kind of say that I, and this is weird because I know John well, but it's like Bon Jovi is a name so ubiquitous and so big that he's in an unfortunate position where he's so big that everyone in that room is like, okay, he's gonna vote for him. So let me give my 10 votes to someone else. And then no one ever does it. Like Radiohead almost got that this year. Like Radiohead was so obvious that it was sort of like, oh, well, I'm sure he'll mention it. I'm sure she'll mention it. Radiohead was the last name mentioned after a three hour process of like 25 people, go, you know what I mean? So it's wow. like, it's 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 a very interesting process. Um, part of me wishes we had. I'm I'm very much in the I'm very much in the belief system that people should get their roses while they're living. Um, and it's such a narrow process to get through those doors, and you know the heartache and pain of knowing that. Ah, oh, damn, Sheik is always just. Ah, damn, they're seven percent away from getting in, or the amount of times that LL Cool J almost got in there and then got denied. And so it's like, I I wish there was a a process that would allow at least seven to nine members per year, because there are a lot of names on there that are so deserving that will get passed up and passed up and passed up, you know. Um, but, you know, I, I love, I just, I love the whole, I love the politics of it all. That's the fun part. Oh, we do too. We always look forward to seeing who's going to be on the list every year. Mm -hmm. uh, Cross Love, thank you so much. And congratulations on Detroit. It's a really powerful song and I appreciate your time. Thank you, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Right. Have a good one. All right.